Well, we can go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Parisa Shirazi. I am the program associate with the Center for Peacemaking, and I'll also be tonight's moderator. And before we get started, I wanted to go through the agenda. We have four parts for tonight. First, we'll hear updates on how the center's mission has informed our response to COVID-19. Second, we'll hear from two PeaceWorks staff and a Marquette student and how young people are learning about nonviolence through the center. Third, the Vice President of Mission and Ministry at Marquette, Father Jim Boyce, will share on how the center animates Marquette's mission. And lastly, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A from the audience. And for those who are not familiar with Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A option that you'll be able to select. Um, if you click on it, you'll be able to submit your questions and our panelists will be able to answer them for you. So we'll go ahead and get started with Pat Canelli, the director of the Center for Peacemaking. Pat? Great, well, uh, thank you, Carissa. And uh, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. It's really exciting for me to see how many people uh, logged on for this, really from all over the country. For those of you in the Midwest, I hope you're enjoying some of our well-deserved sunshine and we're able to dry out a little bit today. And hopefully the folks on the East Coast, uh, you haven't yet gotten all the rain that we dealt with. Um, let me begin just by uh, sharing a little bit about how this evening uh, came about, and it really uh, happened because of three re reasons. You know, the first was, and it's something that I've been really grateful and impressed by the community at the center is we've had so many phone calls from different folks asking how we're doing, what's going on, and what can be done. And so we really wanted to respond and share some updates and let people know that the center is uh, up and active throughout the COVID response, both responding to the needs of students, but really trying to help um, our partners in Milwaukee and around the globe as we respond. Um, the other component uh, that brought this whole evening about was this realization, and it's not anything new, but what a small world it is. And um, I think as we've all been home, we may have noticed a need um, to connect that's always there in good times, but especially in crisis, our, our need for community um, becomes more manifested and we wanted to connect and, and share a little bit of what we're doing. And then I think the third reason why we wanted to do this was um, we've learned a lot about the importance of peacemaking and nonviolence that is kind of unique to the pandemic. And, you know, some of the lessons we've learned, um, I think, you know, could help others as they're trying to help their communities uh, respond to their own needs and, and the needs of their neighbors and the social realities. And I wanted people to know that um, even throughout everything that's going on, the center's still a way for students to explore the power of nonviolence. So um, when I think about what's happened since mid-March, I think about it in really three sort of distinct uh, phases. Um, in these phases, I think, uh, also illustrate how the center is trying to work to create that beloved community that Dr. King, uh, you know, so eloquently called us for when he uh, called us to be nonviolent peacemakers and shows the way we're working with our students and our nonprofit partners, our city and corporate leaders, really to address the needs um, here in Milwaukee and around the globe. So like most of the country, our phase one started in mid-March um, and it involved a lot of transition to virtual things. And I just wanna uh, start off by saying how proud I am of our staff, our uh, peace studies professors and uh, staff and lecturers pivoted all of the peace studies classes for the 50 students online. They got everyone across um, the finish line at the end of the semester. And then our partners in the schools moved all of the middle and high school classes online, both in the Catholic schools as well as the public schools. Um, and along the way, they've been responding to the students' social or spiritual. To be resilient 
middle school and high school are really social times of lives for young people. And what I've seen is our students be really resilient as the classes moved online and study abroad was canceled. Most of our students returned home. And even while practicing social distancing, a lot of them stayed involved in the programs and our graduate students stepped up to help us in our community response. Um, for our seniors, despite the graduation ceremonies being postponed, they've continued to roll up their sleeves and they've also been helping their peers cope. It's really um, hard to overstate what a huge Herculean task it was to move everything online in just a couple weeks, but I couldn't be prouder of how well um, the staff and students did it. The second is um, since mid-March that we went through, um, moved a little beyond triage and it really focused on vital needs in the community. I think most people on the call know that one of our signature peacemaking programs is the park initiative with the Near West Side Partners. And during this time, we've really focused on supporting our residents. We've done a lot of pretty innovative things. We partnered with the bank to get rental grants so that folks uh, who are facing housing insecurity could stay in their house. We helped uh, students who didn't have a place to go to make sure that they had housing. We worked with a lot of our small businesses in the seven neighborhoods, um, either connecting them to bankers if they didn't have banking relationships, how to uh, get businesses online and onto curbside pickups. And then we did a lot of work around uh, virus mitigation. The housing in the communities we work in is really dense. And so we uh, have done things like stenciling public health messages about social distancing, hygiene. We've been distributing uh, protective equipment to at-risk populations, a lot of seniors and others uh, who have conditions that make themselves more vulnerable. And then we've uh, coordinated with our local businesses to step up. You know, some of the neater things that have happened are uh, working with Central Standard Distillery to turn the vodka into hand sanitizer, working with Advocate Aurora to make sure that uh, they had the supplies they need, and now in turn getting those back out to the different food distribution sites. Um, the other component of phase two has really been in the schools. Our PeaceWorks program uh, teaches nonviolence and conflict resolutions to seven schools um, throughout Milwaukee. And our efforts focused on a couple things. One of the valuable things we do is connect uh, families, both the parents and the students, to mental health services. Um, but we also teach them conflict resolution skills. And if anyone read the New York Times this morning, um, they had a great piece highlighting how needed this is. And so we focused a lot on what are the psychological, social, emotional ways people can cope and become resilient during this. And then we tried to address disparities and uh, through some of the strong partnerships that we have, including with uh, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, we've been able to confront some of the digital divide by making sure uh, families have the technology that they need. Um, and then our third phase, and it's really where we're at today, is we've been thinking about how do we help our students, the communities we work in, recover and bounce back. And so we're doing a number of things. Um, in the near west side, we're trying to plant the seeds around economic development, um, as well as uh, retaining existing businesses. We're working with landlords to come up with strategies around uh, not evicting people um, and, and trying to figure out some of the issues uh, with the high rates of unemployment. On campus, we're looking at multimodal teaching. Um, most people probably have heard Marquette is, is intending to bring students back on campus in the fall. And so we want to make sure that we're uh, prepared for both our peace study students, but then our middle school and high school students. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more tonight from our uh, PeaceWorks staff about um, how they've been strengthening these relationships with the families. Um, and then the third phase, and it's something we've been pretty transparent about, you know, the pandemic has uh, brought about a lot of financial challenges. We uh, canceled four of our big fundraisers for the 
Center for Peacemaking. And so I just want to thank all of the folks who decided to make contributions because that um, has gone a long way to ensure that we can continue doing the work that we've done. So when I think about sort of what this has taught all of us about nonviolence, you know, there's a couple lessons that came to mind. One is uh, the shared encounters that we've had. Not only have they transformed how we work, but they've transformed how we've interacted. We've gotten more people around the table to figure out solutions to these problems, to figure out, you know, how do you help a family that's really under a lot of financial, emotional, physical because of proximity, maybe to a lot of people in an apartment building or other stressors cope. Um, and so those that transformation of the way we work, I think has made us more creative and more efficient. The other uh, lesson that I've really gleaned from all of this is that emergencies aren't the time to hand out business cards, but they have been periods for rich discernment. It's been a period for organizing and aligning to address needs um, that we've been able to respond because the center, you know, I've said this since for almost the last decade that at the heart of peacemaking is community. You know, that's what Dr. King, that's what Jesus, that's what Dorothy Day and these other great peacemakers have been all about. And because we've had relationships, we've been able to come up with our creative response. Um, but the, the most important lesson that I've taken away is that a peacemaker's response to COVID really exemplifies how nonviolence operates. Nonviolence invites us to delve in to the problems around us, to be uncomfortable, to face challenges, especially the challenges that our neighbors and our peers on the margins are facing. And that when we're vulnerable like this, we're able to be reactive to needs. We're able to be proactive in strengthening the community. But at the end, it heightens our sense to really make sure the work that we're doing is equipping others to be able to handle and transform their own situations. So when I think about what the Center for Peacemaking's response has been, you know, what I think we've done a really good job at is uh, experimenting with pragmatic peacemaking. And, you know, I'm talking about the nonviolence uh, from the great spiritual traditions, Gandhi, Dorothy Day, King, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, you know, the nonviolence that works on social uplift and radical love the nonviolence that allows people to realize their values, that tries to make sure people's basic needs are met, and, and tries to cultivate community. When I was uh, talking with our seniors, we did a send-off ceremony last week at the end of the week. It was a Friday afternoon. And we were talking, and I was trying to tell them that Dr. King always talked about transforming and building the beloved community by changing the social, economic, and human relationships. And that's what we're trying to do during this COVID crisis. And, you know, I have to say, I couldn't be prouder of the response of our students and our team, but I want everyone on the call to know we couldn't do this without you and that we're going to continue this work. We're grateful for your prayers, your encouragement, and support. And I'm really excited that you're going to hear from the people who are on the front lines today, the students, the staff who are doing the work. And so thank you again for joining us. This was an experiment. It's the first time we've ever done anything. And it just warms my heart to see so many people on this. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. So as Pat alluded, this year our PeaceWorks team has been teaching nonviolence and peacemaking in seven partner schools. We use restorative practices to teach students skills in reducing conflict and managing their emotions as we prepare them for long-term success. In the Catholic schools, our focus on gospel nonviolence helps faith form faithful change makers. Through our partnership with Milwaukee Public Schools, we co-coordinate the MPS Success Center, which provides students who are at risk of suspension or expulsion with the opportunity to receive specialized therapeutic services. Today, we have invited Willing Marilyn, one of the project co-coordinators for the Success Center, to further share about his work. 
Before you joined our team, our staff worked alongside Willie in another MPS alternative school where he was witness to the powerful impact the PeaceWorks curriculum had on his students. We're so grateful that he believes in the program so much that he jumped at the opportunity to become our newest team member. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Willie, to share about your work with the families. Thank you so much. And to everyone here and online, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to share with you my thoughts regarding the Success Center and the Center for Peacemaking. But I thought tonight I would start off with just something from one of our parents to kind of give you sort of an idea of what we're all about and what we're doing. So I'm gonna give a short parent testimony. Since school has been closed, my son has taught me so much of what he has learned. He does have some parts to work on, but to be honest, with everyone keeping in touch and with having our meetings, he has been improving. We have our days, but she states, who doesn't? <laughs> I have to say I wasn't expecting so much from the program, but having so much support from the people in it has been such a blessing. It really makes this time go easier. My son has been very blessed to have the people in this program that no matter what, they are there. I couldn't be any happier with the Success Center. The name itself truly speaks out. So the Success Center, this is an opportunity for young people who are in elementary school and middle school to get that chance that's well-deserved. The opportunity to make some changes in their life and to be able to somewhere down the road understand what nonviolence, community, neighborhood, and all those things mean. So the partnership between the Center for Peacemaking and the Milwaukee Public Schools was created as an alternative school to provide these kinds of opportunities for our students. Myself, I'm known in the school as Mr. Willie. My Milwaukee uh, Public Schools counterpart is known as Mr. Drew. So already we take that stigma away from being Mr. This and Mr. That as far as last name. So I want to go a little deeper into it and just share some stories before I share with you what the school is doing and how it's supporting the children. I want to just share regarding one young man who has been very troubled. And in his, in his experiences at this home school, he was always suspended. No one reached the core of why and no one tried to create opportunities for him to find some success. This young man was with us for three days before everything was shut down. In those three days, he was all over the place causing all kinds of trouble and yelling and swearing and kicking cans and doing everything. At the end of those three days when school closed and we went into this Google Classroom format, we started to develop a relationship once we realized what was really going on in his life. And when you take a young man who's in elementary school and his mother passes away for him in an early age, that's traumatic. So when we talk about no child left behind and we talk about a village, uh, we need a village to raise children, this is an example of that. And what we've been able to do is break down barriers with this family. <laughs> and, and, and it's powerful in a lot of ways because going through this process, I never got a chance to meet his guardian. But I met her through this process of Google Classroom. And when you're able to finally get to the point where you can call the guardian, his grandmother, and I can finally call her grandmother, and she accepts that, that's powerful. And then when they talk, when you talk to grandma's older children and they laugh and smile because it's okay for me to call a grandma. We have taken down the barriers. So now we're able to communicate, we're able to work through some of these issues with Jalen 
And I, I look forward to this young man coming back on campus so we can continue to support him. Another quick example, another young man, today was his birthday. Over the weekend, Mr. Drew and I sent him a Christmas, I mean, a, a birthday card. He received it Monday, yesterday. He called me and he was jumping for joy that someone was just reaching out and sharing this experience with him that maybe he thought nobody other than family members were gonna give him this card. So my point is with all that is that the Success Center, through the Center of Peacemaking and MPS, we are breaking down barriers. We are taking those young people that are coming with a lot of baggage and we're trying to teach them how to be better citizens, how you can do it through nonviolence, and how you create in the school building a sense of community. We've been very successful in doing that. And, you know, th there's another one, a young man, and I'll just share this as the last one. Again, able to call his guardian grandma also. She calls me when he's out of line. Mr. Willie, can you please talk to this boy? Come here, boy, let me talk to you. And then I talk to him, kind of simmer th simmering down. And then, you know, he says, okay, Mr. Willie, I will. But what kind of trust is that? That's, that's phenomenal that people can really feel that they can reach out to you as someone that they've never met because of school closing down. And now we have this connection. All we can do from that is move forward. We're going to get better. I'm, just, I'm so excited about this program because we've just hit the surface by these few things. So as I reach out and share with you these experiences. Willie, I think you want to mute. We are in a very special, very special. And I'm sorry for going to mute, but my hands are moving because I'm excited. I feel, I just feel good inside about what we're doing. And I hope that resonates through uh, this webinar. The potential we have at the Success Center to also impact lives of our students, their families, and their schools is immense. Slowly and consistently, we have begun to see how positively we can impact the children's perception of school when we shift the burden of change away from the students and towards our policies and procedures. Our therapeutic partners have, had, have conducted 43 individual therapy sessions and 16 family sessions. That's phenomenal in this short time that we've been able to do that. Collectively, with the PeaceWorks team, we have made over 462 contacts since March 13th to these families. We are connected. We are connected. We have witnessed students use conflict as an opportunity to develop, to develop trusting, meaningful relationships. And I think to some degree, I've shared that with you and how that's come to be. And it's because they know we're speaking from our heart, that we actually care. And again, it goes back to the old adages of no child left behind, and it takes a village once again to make a child because we're all in this together. We have been able to sit through powerful circles with students as they've learned to be vulnerable and share their experiences with one another as a way to better understand one another's behavior. These conversations have served as a conduit towards practicing empathy and acquiring the language to become advocates for themselves and others. Using our experience in nonviolence, we have watched our middle school students blossom, having earned the opportunity to mentor our younger students through difficult behavior. Another example of that, the young man who came to us with three days, and he's just going all over the place because we're trying to figure out what's going on with him. He is a great basketball player for his age. I mean, he is phenomenal. So Mr. Drew and I, we use that tool to say, hey, in order to do that at the next level, these are the expectations. His way of saying, I'm sorry, is that he wanted to get a couple of the younger elementary kids and he took them to the gym with supervision and he wanted to work and shoot baskets with them. 
that was this young man's of showing Drew and I and everyone else in that building, I am sorry for my behavior. That's when we knew we had an opportunity to really get into this young man's, you know, well-being and begin a process to help. We have seen students with significant behavioral issues at their home schools become trusted, supportive members of our community. And when we talk about our community, first of all, we're talking about our school. Second of all, we're talking about when the student goes home and when they're with their family. Some of these families live in small apartments and they have grandma there. Grandma has some of her children there. They have some of her younger, their younger grandchildren there along with everyone else. And it's amazing that they're able to function and make it through. And I think we help them with that, with our contacts that we do weekly. I think we make a difference when we do that. Mother's Day, we made, a diff made an opportunity to call every guardian, grandma, mom, uh, aunt, or whoever, and said to them, Happy Mother's Day. Now, how is that powerful? We're not connected to that family at all, other than we're outsiders wishing them something special on a special day. Obviously, they got it from their grandkids, they got it from their own children, and they got it from other relatives. But when you make that call and you just get, get on board and you just say, hey, I'm just calling for one thing. I hope your Mother's Day is here. And then we get into the aspect of, well, what you cooking? What you making? I wish I could come over there. And they just smile, they just laugh. It's feeling like this is a very special event, not only for them, but they're trying to include us in that process because they feel safe. That's what the Center for Peacemaking is doing and helping these young people through the Success Center and MPS. And I'm telling you, I have nothing but love for it because we're doing the right things. We're doing the right things. Our unique mission has afforded students the space, time, and support to navigate their frustration with trusting, supportive adults whose relationships they value. And I just shared that with you in, in a way that that's happening. Unsolicited apologies have become the norm. We have seen our students work to fix the relationships they have harmed without adults having to re resort to exclusionary discipline practices. And that's that young man who's a basketball player trying to figure out how he can say sorry in his own way. So with that in mind, it's just an honor to be here tonight. And I love everything I do, working in that building and working with the staff and working with those kids and families. And we're gonna only be able to make it grow. So thank you again once a month, uh, once for all. And right now I'd like to introduce one of my PeaceWorks educational specialist and a good friend of mine. Please welcome Julie Milkman. Hello, like Willie said, I'm a PeaceWorks specialist at the Success Center. As we all know, with the uncertainty of COVID and staying home, it could be a scary time for everyone and extremely isolating. Many of our students have barriers and access issues, which can even leave them more vulnerable to being isolated and at risk. Immediately after the school closed, we were reaching out to families, checking in, providing resource information, and making sure everyone was safe. We quickly transitioned to online learning with Google Classroom to bridge those gaps, to be proactive, to reduce the sense of isolation, and also to teach resiliency and how to deal with difficult emotions during this time. As a professional educator, I was gratified that I was able to be in the front lines during this transition. I know how scared I was and how I felt when this all started, and I couldn't imagine how scary and confusing this was for our students and how it could really affect their mental health and well-being. And that's why I wanted to make sure that I was there for them. Each week, we post engaging lessons to our students on the Google Classroom to help them to be a better equipped to handle the stress of COVID and everyday life. Our yoga teacher posts video lessons to help students practice coping skills during this time. She posts videos showing how students can move around and exercise at home in their rooms, videos on how to breathe to reduce stress, how to control your energy when you are angry, and also videos where you can do partner yoga with your siblings. 
Our students love these videos and always comment how calm they feel afterwards and how they look forward to these videos every day. We have one parent whose son does yoga every day and the student does yoga with his little brothers and spends time teaching them every single move. And it's the parent's favorite thing they'll watch. Our music teacher, teachers also post videos teaching the students drum beats using ordinary objects in their homes. They also teach the students through song. One of my favorite videos was the song that they made to help students cope and to practice mindfulness and gratitude during this time called It's All Right. I found myself singing the song around the house and I know many other staff and students found it catchy as well. The PeaceWorks team has continued our mission of helping to form young people and the power of nonviolence by tailoring our lessons to fit the needs of students during this time. We focused on gratitude, kindness, self-motivation, perspective, self-care, grounding techniques, and a couple more. During this time, we quickly learned the most beneficial aspect of the Google Classroom is the Google Meet feature where we can chat with students and families. This feature has allowed us to connect with our students and reduce the feeling of isolation. The students look forward to our video chat meetings and cannot wait to check in with us and their peers. They have the biggest smiles on their faces, they ask us tons of questions, and they love to share with us glimpses into their lives by showing us baby pictures, their pets, bedrooms, their favorite games, their favorite toys, and they introduce us to all their family members, their mom, their dad, their sister, their aunt, their uncle, their neighbors, their friends, etc. We've seen it all. A lot of our parents like to participate in the video chats with their student. They ask us questions and they receive a lot of support that they are not alone in this. Our students also know that they're not alone in, and this is, here's an example. There was one day when a student asked to check in through video chat with me and another staff member. The student expressed to us that he was not well and having thoughts of suicide. We were able to be with him during this time of crisis by talking with him and encouraging him to call his therapist and crisis workers while we remained on the chat. He was afraid to call them by himself. Personally, I'm extremely grateful that we are, be, we are able to support the student during this very dark time and get him the help that he needed. Despite the school closing, we have been able to stay connected and continue to grow our relationships with students and families. They know that we are in this with them and always be there to respond when needed. In the midst of this challenge, we have found ways to create community through video chats, provide assistance and resources, and continue our work helping our students to become resilient peacemakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily and Julie. Next, we'll be hearing from Kate Morris. Kate is a rising senior in Marquette and one of our 50 Peace City students. For the past three years, she has served as a nonviolence educator through the center, working alongside our PeaceWork staff in the Catholic schools. And last summer, Kate was one of 10 students to receive a fellowship through the Center for Peacemaking to teach peace education in Washington, DC. This MNJ fellowship was made possible through our generous donors and we thank them for the ways that they've been able to shape our students. And so we're so excited to have you join us today, Kate, and I'll pass it along to you. Thank you. So like Frida said, my name is Kate Morris. I'm an incoming senior studying social welfare and justice, peace studies, and psychology. Um, I've been working at the center for three years now. I started working right away freshman year. I was looking for a job and <laughs> saw something about the Center for Peacemaking and thought it sounded interesting. So I came in and talked to Sherry Walker about all the different student employment opportunities that the center has. Um, I've held a couple different positions, but I've been working with um, PeaceWorks as a non-violent -student, non student educator for four semesters. Um, in those semesters, I've been able to work in five different Catholic schools with four different adult staff members, which has been really interesting and really cool to see how different staff members teach the curriculum and also how different schools, classrooms, and age groups take those lessons and really implement it in their classroom. And it's really interesting because in every classroom I've been in, they have taken that information. And I haven't been in a single classroom that hasn't like really fully embraced PeaceWorks. Um, as a student educator, I also get to have those more one-on-one -on -one connections with the students, whether it's further explaining the lessons and activities to them to make sure that it really clicks with them, um, or just talking to them about their weekend, their interests, their friends. 
I've been able to make some really amazing connections with some awesome students and have been able to have some really important conversations about things going on in their life or struggles they're having and have been able to implement what we've been talking about in PeaceWorks into their everyday life, um, which has been really cool and has been one of my favorite parts of PeaceWorks. Um, we teach a wide variety of lessons, but my two bits are grounding techniques and bully thoughts because they're very interactive and are also the two lessons that I feel like every single student in the classroom really grasps and gets involved with. Um, with grounding techniques, we talk about being overwhelmed with your emotions, whether it's sadness or anger or anxiety, and we give them physical examples of things they can do to calm down. And it's, it's really fun to teach them all and to hear about things that they've already learned about in other classes or at home um, for how they kind of already ground themselves. Um, and with bully thoughts, we talk about the negative thoughts that we all have and how they're not true and how we can kind of rewire our brain to talk about them. Um, and it's really interesting to see those kids be so vulnerable in that lesson because they really share with themselves and with their, their peers and with us um, some of the things they're thinking and kind of what they're struggling with, uh, which is really special to have that conversation and that dialect with them. It's also cool to see how faith and spirituality and gospel nonviolence can be incorporated into nonviolence education and how we do work that into our Catholic school curriculum. Um, and also working in education has been inspiring for me personally. Um, I've always wanted to be a social worker and I didn't know that school social workers existed until I met the Jesuit school social worker at one of our PeaceWorks um, schools during a lesson and got to talking with him. And so now I know what I want to do when I grew up, so that's good. <laughs> um, I've also been able to ex um, explore PeaceWorks in different communities. Like Prisa said, I received a summer peacemaking fellowship from the center um, last year and was able to go to Washington DC to work with an organization called Little Friends for Peace um, which is a great nonprofit that's all about peacemaking and peace building. And I worked at their summer peace camps, which were basically our PeaceWorks lessons, but just full day, full week versions of it. It was so fun and super cool. And MJ and Jerry Park, the founders of Little Friend for Peace, were very interested in what Marquette and the center does and what our PeaceWorks lessons are like. So I got to talk to them all about our PeaceWorks lessons and kind of collaborate with them on that. And then also have the opportunity to take what I learned from Peace Camp there back to the center and to Milwaukee and PeaceWorks. Um, working at the center also is what inspired me to become a Peace Studies minor. I didn't know that existed until um, meeting some of my other student um, employees at the center, which is another thing that I love is that whether it's the other student employees or the adult staff, I'm just constantly surrounded by such passionate people who are all working towards the same vision and same goal, but just in very different ways, which is really cool to be able to talk to everyone about what they're working on and what they're passionate about. And whether it's in Peace Studies classes or at the center or in PeaceWorks, my favorite thing about it all is just how universal the idea of peacemaking and peace building is. Um, I've heard some great lectures and speakers and have read such amazing things. I've read books that I've stolen from the center and need to give back when we get back in the fall. Um, just such amazing things about uh, issues that pertain to us all, how we all are in the society working together. Um, we all have these skills that we can develop and conversations that need to be had. I always say that I love being able to talk to fifth graders about positive communication in the morning and then go home to my 20 year old roommates and talk to them about positive communication as well. Um, so I just am very lucky that the center has been such an incredible and huge part of my Marquette experience. I could not imagine what the last three years would look like without it. Um, and I'm just very glad and proud to represent the center today and with my job and in everything. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. We're so grateful for you and all our great students. So before we move on to our last speaker for today, I wanted to encourage you all to continue to send in some questions using the Q&A um, feature at the bottom of your screen. So lastly, we will hear from Father Jim Boyce of the Society of Jesus and Vice President of Mission and Ministry at Marquette. Father Voice joined the Marquette community this past January and has, after, I'm sorry, after serving as the rector of the Jesuit community for Gonzaga University. We're so grateful to have his leadership and support as we carry out Marquette's Catholic Jesuit mission. Father Voice. 
Thank you, Parisa. And thanks to Willie, Julie, and Kate. Wonderful stories. Uh, you're, you're expanding my own education. So because I'm so new here, I didn't really know anything about the Peace Center when I came. Uh, and it has been one of the places of consolation in the time that I've been here to hear uh, what's going on, to see the wonderful work that's being done. And uh, it is a real privilege to be here with you this evening and to share with you a little bit, as, as Pat said at the beginning, about how I see the place of um, the Peace Center in the mission of the university and, uh, and the mission of the Society of Jesus. So what I'd like to do is to just sort of say a few general things about the Society of Jesus and mission and then more, a, a little bit of an update and then talk more about the university and the Center for Peacemaking. As you know, uh, Marquette University is a mission-driven institution and it exists within the context of the wider mission of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits worldwide. Uh, and that mission can generally be stated as uh, trying to transform the world uh, for justice and peace in order to bring about reconciliation among all peoples in accord with the vision of reconciliation and transformation proclaimed by Jesus in the Gospels. And that's the heart of what the Society of Jesus is about, and it's why we got into education and why we're also involved in so many missions around the world. About two years ago, after a 16-month process of conversation among Jesuits with Jesuits and our colleagues in the various works that we do, um, the Society of Jesus articulated what we call four apostolic preferences. These are not so much tasks to be performed as they are internal um, values and commitments that we're all invited, everyone involved in Jesuit works is invited to internalize, to make our own uh, as a kind of, as in the form of a deep caring about four matters that are of great importance to the mission vision of the Society of Jesus. Our deep care about these matters is supposed to inform how we approach and evaluate everything that we do. Whether it's teaching in the classroom, whether it's serving in a parish, whether it's working with refugees, or whether it's doing the work of the Peace Center here in Milwaukee. Let me just name briefly what they are. The first is the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. To see them and to present them as a way to God, and in a particular way, to see discernment as integral to what it means to be sent on mission and to be living out the mission of the Society of Jesus. Secondly, the second uh, priority is solidarity with and advocacy for the marginalized, the excluded, the powerless, the voiceless, those who are underserved. The third preference or priority is to accompany young people and to support them in looking toward the future with hope and meaning and a sense of purpose, to look towards the possibilities of a life of meaning and value uh, in a time of so much instability and change. And the fourth apostolic preference is a care for the earth. This is our common home. These four values, these four preferences, are meant to be internalized as a way of being in the world, that when we look at the problems that we need to address, we'll see the possibility for working out of the experience of the exercises and also of drawing others into what they're about in whatever way is appropriate to their circumstances. It's about using discernment to sort out how we want to proceed and engage with the issues. And that discernment takes place, as others have noted in uh, the presentations this evening, they're really grounded in, it's really grounded in relationship with real people, particularly with the people who oftentimes have no voice, who have not been well served, who are excluded from the resources of the cultures in which we live. And to do so in a spirit that seeks to reach out to and accompany children who, uh, and young people who oftentimes may find themselves feeling hopeless. As we heard uh, spoken of by Julie earlier about the, the young person who was feeling 
suicidal, to reach out and to be with them and help them to find the way to hope and new life and to accompany them and then to care for the earth, our common home, to realize that all of the works that we do need to be done in a way that's conscious of the fact that resources are not infinite and that they need to be cared for and cherished and reverenced because they are a gift from God and they are also the stage on which we encounter the God who loves us. These apostolic preferences have now come to Marquette University and helped to shape the way in which we're thinking about how we want to be positioned as an institution of higher education that's trying to provide formative experiences for our students so that they are able to go out into the world and, as we say, to be the difference. We want to help our students to internalize the same kind of posture of care and sense of agency that, uh, that we're called to with the apostolic preferences, but to see this as true of themselves, that they have the resources to be able to discern, that they have a sense of solidarity with and advocacy for those who are marginalized and powerless, that they are able to accompany young people and support them in finding hope as they look to the future, and that they can do so in a way that cares for our earth, our common home. This is what's at the heart of and has become a, a kind of a theme for how we look at the work that we do at Marquette. And it strikes me that in an extraordinary way that I never would have anticipated, those sensibilities, those preferences were already alive in the work of the Peace Center ever before the preferences were named two years ago. The programs of service and outreach that the center does for our neighborhood and beyond, uh, for the city and reaching well beyond the boundaries of the city are deeply imbued with sensitivity to those issues and informed by the spiritual exercises and by the concern for discernment. The way in which the center coordinates with the university to design coursework, to help build up the peacemaking minor and major, and to provide that as an opportunity for our students to ever more deeply internalize this sense of concern for this larger world. The scholarly research that's done, all of these bring our students together with real people who are living in the reality of the need for the work that they do. It draws on real life experiences and draws it into the, the academic formation that our students have, transforming that from something that's not simply academic, but something that has experiential depth and that can really live on in the memories and the hearts of our students before they go on into the world beyond Marquette. And it engages our students in an ongoing reflective process that's informed by the spiritual exercises and guided by discernment so that the skills that they learn there for processing the challenges they encounter become life skills for moving beyond Marquette University so that they can be the people who can go out and be the difference in our world. Uh, it's just, it's very hard for me to put into words how inspired I am by the work that takes place at the Center for Peacemaking and how grateful I am for the vision of those who brought it to be and who, who are now carrying it forth. The sense of teamwork that guides it, the sense of discernment and commitment to transforming our society to become more peaceful by being more just, uh, I just can't speak for inviting me to be with you this evening and for giving me the opportunity to share with uh, your supporters uh, my perspective uh, from as the Vice President for Mission and Ministry. I'm just deeply proud of the work that you're doing and the spirit in which you do it and grateful that you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. So we'll have an opportunity to do a Q&A right now as well. Pat, would you like to say a few words before we jump on to the Q&A session for today? Sure, well, I do wanna be uh, mindful and respectful of everyone's time. I know uh, we went maybe five minutes longer than we thought. This was our uh, first six 
experiment at a at a webinar and uh you know gandhi talked a lot about his whole life was an experiment with truth and and, and deepening and nonviolence. so if you take anything away I, I hope you hear that you know we're trying to be creative we're trying to use nonviolence, and we're trying to uh shape the community and students to go out into the world as peacemakers and we welcome any questions um and Again, thank you for spending part of the evening with us and, and for all of your words of encouragement, your support um, that you provide to the center. And then I think, Parisa, you probably can see, I can't see the questions that are coming in. Maybe you can read some yes. of them off. Sure. So, Pat, this question is actually for you. So how is the center staying in touch with local residents and their needs during an era of social distancing? Sure. You know, tonight we focused a lot on the PeaceWorks program and, and the work we're doing in the schools, but our other major project is the park initiative and the near west side. Those are the seven neighborhoods. Um, and really our efforts have focused on uh, four things. The first is with housing. Um, we know that it's one of the densest and poorest parts of the city. So We've been trying to meet vital needs. Uh, we have a homeless intervention team that we formed that both is helping people pre preemptively who are facing housing security, getting people rental assistance grants, helping work with landlords and that type of thing so that people don't become homeless. And then we're also doing a lot of outreach to folks who find themselves in a homeless situation. One of the things is our near west side neighborhood is a community that cares. We have a quarter of Wisconsin homeless beds. And so we've been looking at housing. Another major way we're reaching out uh, with residents is really uh, tapping into those networks and relationships. I said it earlier that, you know, now isn't the time to hand out business cards. But what we had done over the last four years is we developed an extensive uh, texting and phone tree of neighbors with the 28,000 people who live in the seven neighborhoods around Marquette newsletters. And we host a weekly webinar for uh, the community in which we invite local folks, whether it's the alderman or the state representative or um, the executive director of the local, uh, it's called Neighborhood House, the after school program, and, and it's a QA and a and, and it's telling people, okay, if you need food, this is how you can access it. Um, and then with the schools, one of the great things we've been doing is helping uh, get materials out at the food distribution sites when uh, folks are picking up their academic things. And, you know, just like the PeaceWorks team is cultivating community, we're finding that during this time, listening, being present, being reactive, and then being proactive to put people to handle things on their own has really been the strategy. Great, thanks, Pat. Just to be aware of time, I'll um, have a panelist answer one more question. Julia, I think this question would be um, appropriate for you. How is the PeaceWorks team connected with students who may lack technology during this time? Yeah, that's a great question. We worked with um, Milwaukee Public Schools and we, um, well, well, through the Success Center, we actually handed out Chromebooks um, for families that needed them as well. And then we got a grant with Milwaukee Response where um, we were able to supply students with um, Chromebooks if they weren't able to get it with the Success Center, but also headphones and other technology pieces that they may need during this time. So all of our students right now all have technology so they could go on the Google Classroom and do our video chats with us. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, I wanted to thank everyone again for joining our webinar for tonight. We would love to uh, connect with you further throughout the summer. We do have an upcoming program on Friday, June 5th. It's going to be a virtual performance of Steinbeck, a scribe of Social Conscious. So we would love to have you there. I added the Eventbrite link into the chat. If you all have any other questions or would like to connect with the center further, feel free to send us an email and we look to continue to connect with you all. Thank you so much and hope you all have a great evening. Bye-bye.